Hello, everyone. Today with us, we have George Stiffman, who works to promote Chinese tofu in the United States. He recently launched a book called Broken Cuisine, aimed at teaching Western cooks how to use tofu and other ingredients beyond just Chinese cooking. He's also active in the effective altruism community, where he co-leads the EA Los Angeles group. For our viewers, tofu is a condensed soy milk that is high in protein, and George describes it really well on his website, where he says that it can taste bready, like aged cheese, and even melt. Now, one of the really big things about tofu that definitely made me really excited about it is that it has the potential to displace conventional meat. But alternative proteins also do this. And so my first question is, do you think it's still important that we try to find ways to replace meat with alternative proteins, even if it seems like right now we couldn't imagine people wanting to make that shift? And I ask this because you've written about how tofu is different in that it's something that isn't subtractive or substitutive like other vegan food. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. First of all, I want to say that I, I think we need a portfolio of options in the alt protein world. We need realistic replicas to meat because some people do just really love the flavors of meat we also though i think need other options um i found that in the u.s a lot of chefs tend to be less excited about alt proteins in the the meat analog side compared to sort of convenience-minded consumers um and you know a lot of chefs who care about say the origins of their food these stories about how it, how you know, how their produce was grown or how their animals were raised, uh, that that's a big driver for what they perceive of as quality. And a lot of the meat analogs just don't have that story and probably won't be able to have a convincing one. Um, that being said, you know, there's, well, I'll add another piece. Um, I think the meat analog story right now is is one that's really sexy um you know if we can just get meat that tastes the same or better at a convenient at a this a similar if we can get a meat that tastes the same or better at the right price point and that's convenient then people will just switch over i think that might be true to some degree um but like it's not clear whether the technology used for say like burgers is gonna be that generalizable to say like ground chicken or whole cut chicken or whatever. And we have, you know, not just a few types of meat. Um, I mean, there's a cow has like whatever, dozens of ways to be eaten. Um, so I think that challenge is just like bigger than a lot of people think about and granted you know if we can take out a big portion of fast food which we're struggling to do a little bit um but maybe that you know if we can do that that's already huge um but i'm interested in not just substituting for meat one for one i think that i think we need to like also change the culture around eating we need chefs to take vegan cooking seriously and plant-based cooking seriously which overwhelmingly at least where i'm at in la they just don't um, and we need to show consumers like new exciting experiences with plants. Um, and so that's why I think this sort of non-substitutive additive approach can hit a few boxes that the meat analogs can't. Yeah, and I think that um, one thing that's especially true is that it's very um, difficult to replace all kinds of meat and we're really far off from doing that. And I think that at least in the run up to that, we should find ways to uh, get people to shift away from meat consumption and try tofu instead. I think that um, another thing that you pointed out was asking chefs to take um, tofu more seriously and vegan food more seriously. What's the main difference between tofu and plant-based patty? I read that some alternative protein meat is less versatile. What does that mean for someone who doesn't know much about cooking? The way that I understand it is that if you design a plant-based burger, it's gonna be really great for plant-based burger applications, but maybe not quite as easy to use in other uh, like 
beef applications. I mean, there was a famous video that came out on Chinese social media a couple of years ago. And, you know, famous with quotation marks. It had a few million views. It was by one of the most popular food bloggers uh, named Chef Wang, uh, Wang Gang. And he was doing a collab with an American who speaks Chinese and is really big in China named Guo Jie Rei. And Guo Jie Rei brought him Beyond Meat back from the US when it wasn't available. And uh, he tried it and it was like, he thought this was horrible. The the Beyond Meat didn't release oil the same way that the meat he was used to released oil. It didn't season the sauce in the same way. And and so it's just every these little details that say for stir fry uses are really, really important. It just like makes miss the mark. Even though that China even though Chinese stir fries do use ground beef often. Um and you know, when you're talking about fast food sort of, again, convenience-minded consumers, these sort of differences don't matter as much. Um, and, you know, maybe, again, maybe this is a small case and maybe most ground beef uses are really, really fine. Um, but I, I do think that it's it's a lot more complicated than people think. Um, and again, you know, that's, um, you, you know, on, on the flip side, uh, one thing that's nice is that ground beef does have a lot of existing uses versus and so versus tofu and specifically these, these other Chinese legacy tofus. Um, they don't have a lot of uses in, in Western cooking styles or outside of uh, Chinese and Asian cuisines. And so while they might be versatile, people don't even know how to use them. There's There's kind of other challenges there. Yeah, and I think another thing that I had in mind is that if tofu is likely to be successful and um, have a large market size in the coming years, uh, would that, according to you, take demand away from alternative proteins? Is there a trade-off here? And if there isn't, then is tofu meant for a different market of people? Well, what's interesting is I think most alternative protein products that are eaten these days are eaten by vegans. There's these stats that beyond an impossible throw around that's like you know, 80% or 90% of the people who bought our product at the local grocery store also had meat in their cart. And I think that's been sort of misinterpreted as saying that, oh, this is taking away from meat demand. No, probably family shop for a lot of different people or, um, um, and like other sort of evidence points to that maybe maybe vegans are the people who order these things at restaurants and so on um again don't don't quote me on this i'm i'm citing the these uh anecdotes from conversations i've had not from hard research on my end i think um if it's the case that vegans are the bulk of the alt protein market right now then really these products are going to cannibalize the market anyways. Um, what I think is more likely is that when you're starting up either a meat analog company or something like tofu, you need sort of like that minimum, you need like that, that minimum viable market. I, that's not really a word, but you need like enough consumers to, to, to um, you know, so, you know, actually I, I take that back. Um, I guess if you're VC funded, often you're not profitable for a while. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I take that back. Um, I do think like, um, so I guess to to go back to that earlier point, I, in the world where all protein companies are all competing for the same sort of early adopter market, then yeah, there's a little bit of cannibalization. Um, I think though there's a world where again, like we look beyond just this group and I think the products that appeal beyond just this group um, may be more on the tofu side or maybe more on the other exciting culinary side. And, 
you know, so I, I hope to do my best to target these people who haven't been served. Um, and again, they, they, they naturally serve slightly different audiences. Again, if you're talking convenience consumers or if you're talking like hardcore foodies or you're talking like, you know, hardcore chefs. Um, so the hope is that we cover sort of these demands better. Yeah, I want to now talk about actually growing the tofu market. I think that talking about China might be a good starting point. So my question is, how come, despite the prevalence of rare Chinese tofu in China, meat consumption is still pretty high and tofu is looked down upon? Is there more that has to be done than simply popularizing tofu in the market if people are still going to consume meat? Absolutely. I think it's all relative. In that in China, tofu has a history that was associated with poverty for a while. And there was an absence of meat that led people to want to consume more of it. The US is completely different, or the you know, other countries are completely different in that there was never really much tofu. And so if tofu were promoted, it would be something that's added in. And it's not necessarily leads to perceptions of you're missing meat. It's like you have something else that's exciting. So from my experience, when I take friends on tofu tours and to Chinese restaurants around town, you know, I've taken keto friends who are hardcore meat eaters um, to places that serve meat. And now they go back, you know, all the time, drive 30, 40 minutes to get there. And they call it the tofu restaurant and they order five types of tofu in a spicy stir fry pot and don't even look at the meat section. So I think one of the biggest mistakes that one of the biggest things that helped me in going vegan and going vegetarian was when I started deciding I wanted to go that direction, I stopped trying new foods that had dairy and like that had eggs because I'm like, I don't want to be addicted to these foods. I don't want to like these foods. Um, because I want to get away from them. And I think like, you know, if consumers, when they start eating more tofu, eat it in the context of like dishes with a ton of meat, well, then maybe there will be this sort of expectations building up. Um, but granted, I think, I think generally it's sort of like we're adding this into people's diets. It's exciting. It's new. It tastes good. Yeah. Yeah. And um, even within China, I think having more people uh, eat tofu would be a good thing. So how do you see that we could actually popularize tofu in China such that we can come back to the days where, you know, people ate tofu instead of meat mainly? Yeah. And to be clear, when we talk about tofu having sort of a bad rep in China, it doesn't mean that people don't eat it. And a lot of people actually love tofu. Um, tofu, and at least the southeast of the country and like Cantonese cooking or Fujianese cooking uh, almost always contains meat in the dish. Um, but if you're more concerned about overall meat consumption rather than if you eat or not, that still represents like sort of clogging up your protein budget. You know, you're eating less meat than you might otherwise. Um, you know, and a lot, a lot of, a lot of stuff is cooked with, with lard, etc. I think there is still stigma around tofu. Um, it's still seen as something that's cheap to order for a date or a group of friends. You know, there's, there's, there's problems like that. Um, it sounds sort of like imprecise and. Well, yeah, it sounds kind of imprecise, but I do think just changing the culture around these foods and how they're perceived and, and getting people to associate tofu with something that's amazing, that's their legacy. It's a great weapon against climate change. It's the pride of Western countries or things like that, I think have the ability to to start planting seeds in China, people who say, oh no, this is like a, not just like an ingredient we have, it's like the coolest ingredient. Um, you know, it's like the most sustainable, the most healthy, um, it's the most exciting. Um, so, you know, I don't know how likely these things are. It's, it's pretty speculative, um, but if we can change some of these associations elsewhere, then yeah. 
Maybe yeah, not. and it, yeah, and is is a big advantage of rare Chinese tofu, at least in the West, that it's cheaper. I feel like we're struggling a lot to find cheap plant-based options and cultivated meat currently runs at a loss for those producing it. Do you think um, tofu is cheaper than meat in the West despite its limited supply? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I should have a better sense of this, actually. I don't shop in the, <laughs> like, I don't visit the meat aisles too often. So I can't quote you the latest price of chicken per pound and, like, how much protein there is in there. Um, but generally, I mean, if you get a block of firm tofu at an Asian market in the U.S., you'll be, you'll be paying around $1.50 to $2 for that block. And that's 30 grams of protein you know, depending on how you eat, that's enough for one or two people for a meal. Um, I think that's that's pretty affordable. And there's other tofus out there that are actually cheaper because they're imported, they're produced abroad where, you know, cost of labor is cheaper, um, things like that. So I, I think it can be really affordable. A challenge though with promoting these tofus is that, um, if you don't take VC money for your business and VCs really want something that's more higher tech or really defensible or has like a clear, um, you have a clear customer acquisition cost and clear customer lifetime value. And so you can just sort of plug money into marketing and grow really fast. Like if you have things like that, then, you know, VCs might be like, oh yeah, hell yeah, let's invest. Um, but for a low tech sort of more generic product like tofu, it's, it seems more likely that I'll have to go the traditional route of, you know, taking out business loans or doing smaller friends and family rounds um, or boot, just like bootstrapping. And so in the world of bootstrapping, if you're relying on your revenue to grow, then you need to have prices that are gonna allow you to pump money back into the business. Um, so in that sense, you know, there's a world in which we find a way to kind of do that, get get some outside funding and grow faster and not worry about price as much. And in that world, I think prices will be pretty affordable from the get-go. More likely, we'll have to price a little bit higher than your Tokyo Chinese supermarkets and um, continue like slowly growing like that. Um, and I should say, even with slightly higher prices, we're still talking about in the range of other proteins. This is not as expensive as your Beyond Meats, not as expensive as as your, uh, probably not as expensive as your meats. Yeah, I think that the fact that it's really affordable sounds promising. Um, and my next question is, how likely do you see tofu being adopted in the Western diet? Usually people are accustomed to meat, high fat and sugar. And is it, uh, it is true that um, Asian food is eaten, but often rarely in the West. So do you see this as something that can actually make up a big part of Western diet? I think it's all a game of use cases. So if we can figure out the pizza of tofu, a dish that has widespread appeal, is easy to make, is tied to our culture in a way that we really care about, then I don't see a reason why these foods can't spread. And there's actually analogs in the past of tons of food spreading. Um, for example, Norwegian salmon, you know, or salmon wasn't eaten as a sushi fish in Japan until Norwegian salmon producers we're like, hey, we need to create a market for these products. We have a ton um, of supply and Japan needed, uh, Japanese people eat a ton of fish. Um, and then basically the government, uh, well, not the government, I think it was partially the government and partially like um, sort of uh, salmon trade groups dumped millions of dollars into getting Japanese chefs to talk about these fishes, um, dispel, notions that Norwegian salmon was like Japanese salmon, that it had a lot of parasites and stuff, that it couldn't be eaten raw. And 
zero campaign of just working with a lot of chefs to incorporate these into the restaurants. Over time, salmon grew a lot. And then in the US, for example, salmon's a big sushi fish. And, you know, that's your, um, your California roll. Um, so, so, you know, and that's not, that's not the only case. When Thailand was forming as a nation, the new king of Thailand was like, we need to have more foods, again, that we have in common with each other. There were also food security issues and rice would go bad after a year. So he ended up promoting the use of rice noodles, which were a popular staple in China and have a shelf life two to three times as long as, as ordinary rice. Um, and through that process and working with chefs, you know, pad thai came around. Now pad thai is, is known as in the West as like the dish of Thailand, but at the time it was invented. Um, and I think it was like the 1940s or 60s. So that's just to be said, that's just to say that when I personally think of cuisine, it feels like something that's always been here. It's my family's culture, it's all I know. But in reality, all the foods that we eat a lot of today were probably invented in the last 50 years, if not 100 years, if not 150 years. And now that there is more and more globalization and cross-cultural contact, more and more travel, um, I think there's more opportunities for these new foods to be developed. And with social media and you know more marketing, <laughs> there's more opportunities for these foods to stick. That being said, there's also more competition. And, you know, the meat lobby has a lot of money. There's, yeah, groups like that. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, especially the fact that cuisine often does change over time. And um, I do see that happening. It's just a matter of whether tofu is going to also um, be something that's widely adopted. As you pointed out, there's also competition um, given, you know, the trend of globalization. What do people currently, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Do you mind actually if I add on to that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So just to be more specific even than in my last point, what are some potential use cases for these tofus that could have wide appeal? There's one type of tofu that's from the Shanghai region. And so we call it Shanghai tofu. It's Chinese name is literally translates to vegetarian chicken. And it's not called that because it's really a direct substitute, but people really love it in the Shanghai region. And it's used in a couple culinary preparations similar to how, how animal chicken would be cooked. What's special about this tofu is it has a custardy texture and a slightly bready um, mouthfeel when it's made a certain way. If you basically cut it, chop it into little dumplings and stew it in a soup, it turns into this sort of matzo ball, you know, mouthfeel, which you know, traditional Ashkenazi Jewish food. It's also double the protein of extra firm tofu. Uh, sorry, double the protein of super firm tofu. Um, and really, really delicious. I think that's, for example, something that is sort of a no brainer. People will try this in soup and think, oh yeah, this is like really good. I want to eat more of this. And, you know, there's other tofus that I think could be indispensable in certain types of sauces. That seems sort of easy. Granted, that's not as much of a meat substitute. Um, and I think thin yuba or tofu skin in pastry applications is going to become very popular very soon. There's not really much good in this vegan and vegan pastries gluten-free pastries just struggle they're really hard to do for american pat patissiers <laughs> or however however that said um and I, I think thin yuba actually does a lot more with that um you know granted these are just a couple applications they're not even the the pastries aren't even that targeted towards meat but as soon for each application we can develop that sticks that like systematically just increases our available market. So I, I think about it that way. Yeah, and um, 
I think this nicely brings me into this question, which is what do people usually associate tofu with in the West? Is it that it's high protein or a popular Chinese ingredient? Um, are there also negative connotations with it that it's like unhealthy or smelly that we need to dispel? What I didn't realize before talking with more people around around tofu is that a lot of Americans who don't live around Asian communities tend to actually think of tofu as a health food first and foremost. And in that sense, their first you know, impressions of tofu are maybe this pasty white firm block, unseasoned, cubed and added to a salad, or yeah, I mean, basically that that sort of style, um, which taste is extremely subjective. And so there's no such thing as like something that's really good. You know, people might say, oh, yeah, Doritos are, you know, optimized for salt, umami and fat. But like people don't realistically think Doritos are the best food in the world. Um, I, I don't think there's a standard there. Um, I mean, it, it, there, there's like some sort of addictiveness, but there's not like for cuisine as it stands, like that sort of standard. Um, but that being said, this sort of approach of unseasoned tofu cubes just added to a salad is really unappealing to most people. And from that, I think a lot of people who try tofu in these sorts of applications and then see it at the grocery store are neither have good associations nor know how to cook it. And that not know how to cook it is a big barrier as well. Um, what was your original question? I realized I kind of- Oh no, it was just about the, the connotations. I think this answers it perfectly. Um, and you just brought up, uh, you know, the fact that a lot oh. of people might, yeah. Is there One anything more that- thing. Sorry, do you mind if I keep, if I jump in like that? And I assume you're gonna be editing it after. Yeah, so I will. Yeah, you can jump in as much as you so another another connotation that's sort of like an anti-connotation. People tend to think of tofu as a firm white block. And so the connotation that there aren't all these other types of tofus out there that are radically different in flavor and texture and cooking style. So so that like is actually a really positive connotation to have right now, because as soon as you serve someone some of these other tofus, they're instantly just shocked and impressed and invariably will say, I never knew tofu could taste like that. I never knew tofu could have that texture. On the supermarket side, it's harder because you can't get people to try your food. You know, it comes in a package. So we'll see how that works. Um, but yeah, definitely on the tasting side, it's a very positive connotation to have people think that tofu is so boring, as long as they're willing to try it. Yeah, and is it difficult for people to prepare tofu dishes? Um, you pointed out that a lot of people don't know how to cook them, uh, but you know, based off of what I've seen um, online, a lot of the dishes look delicious, but I'm just wondering if people who aren't expert cooks could still prepare this as something they can eat. One of the principles in our book is that the standard conventional tofus available at most supermarkets are really great in Asian cooking styles, which rely a lot on moist heat cooking, braising in sauces, stir frying with a ton of like, uh, just a ton of oil-based flavors that permeate your tofu really well. But how Western cooks tend to use tofu in dry, fry, like frying it dry, sauteing it without much sauce, don't, adequately get enough salt into there or enough flavor. And so that in and of itself is just not an insurmountable problem, but it's hard for a lot of Western cooks on the first or second try to get right. That coupled with the fact that most recipes online for tofu were made by more people who are oriented towards healthy eating or plant-based eating rather than who are oriented towards just like generally obsessed foodie like i want to get the best flavor out of my tofu so i think the the availability of information is also uh, not directed at like how can we maximize the goodness of this 
thing um, in the flavor department. Um, but, you know, if you simply blanch your tofu block, your firm tofu block in really salty water, that's as salty as pasta water, it's salty as the sea for a couple minutes, you instantly solve one of the biggest issues, which is that flavor absorption. And then if you dry cook it or cook it in another sauce, it's gonna be perfectly seasoned. Um, you know, there's, there's little things like that. Um, I do think that these other Chinese legacy tofus, Shanghai tofu, um, thin yuba, spongy tofu, these in some ways are actually a lot easier to cook with. One of them, spongy tofu, is pre-seasoned with enough salt and a little bit of umami in there too sometimes, as well as a little, little helping of oil. So it has a creamier mouthfeel. It has a flavorful, you know, base. And if you dry cook it or you moist heat cook it um, in a sauce, either way, it tastes great. Um, so I think once tofus like that are more common, it's going to be a no-brainer. It's super easy for people to, to, to work with. And again, Shanghai tofu, it has really complicated applications. You can fry it in certain ways. You know, one of our one of my favorite recipes is like a French toast style preparation. We first slice the Shanghai tofu, dry it a little bit in the oven for four and a half minutes on the dot. You can't do four and 45, you can't do 415. You fry for you dry it in the oven for four minutes, 30 seconds, and then you fry it in oil that has to be a certain temperature for 30 seconds. And then that creates the right amount of dryness inside, combined with oil inside to tenderize it without making it tough. And then it's it's stewed in the most delicious, you know, sweet cream. You know, and then after stewing it and and, and steeping it in the cream, it's taken out to dry. And then after drying, it's, it's thrown in the freezer. And then after throwing it in the freezer, once it freezes through, you take it out, you thaw it, <laughs> and then you sear it. And through this, whatever, however many step process that is, you get a really unique sort of value out of this ingredient. That's great. No one's going to cook that unless you're really obsessed. But again, you could throw it in a soup, and there instantly you have a delicious dumpling. Um, and again, there's gonna, you know, there's tons of, you can take one sort of tofu in our book, throw it in the grilled cheese, do nothing to it, just throw it in the grilled cheese. Um, tons of stuff like that. Yeah, and I think that um, another thing that you mentioned uh, in, I think an EA Forum article that you wrote is that there is a supply problem in the US and, my question is, is the supply problem more of a demand problem in that the demand has to create the supply? Um, and so are there things that we can do to instantly popularize tofu? Like, as you pointed out, getting chefs to adopt more tofu sounds great, but I'm unclear how many people they may reach in comparison to, let's say, a fast food restaurant or big restaurant chains like Red Robin, maybe BJ's or even Costco. Yeah, so there's the direct approach for all proteins to say, hey, let's just find a, a use that uses a lot of meat and substitute tofu in there. Or find like something super close. And, you know, I think that's good to do. But I, I again, I think we need a portfolio of options. And if people, people actually, going back to the connotations point, you know, a lot of meat eaters have the connotation that tofu is a meat substitute. And when they're thinking about all the things they love about meat, they love the, the complex aromas that, you know, when meat is cooked, it produces all these mayor notes that is really like savory and, and rich. And they like sort of the natural bloody flavors maybe. And they like, you know, the sinewy tendons. You know, you, you, you could have a list that's a dozen points long. You could pair that to a block of firm tofu and it hits none of those points. The only point that it hits is it has a lot of protein, but not even as much protein as, as a steak. So I think this, the, the moment we start associating vegan products with meat is the moment that consumers have insurmountable expectations. I think there's other there's ways around it. Um, 
with plant-based dairy, one of the biggest appeals of it in my mind, you know, besides a lot of Americans being lactose intolerant and dairy just not even tasting that good to most people, um, we really just have a portfolio of plant-based milks now where oat milk tastes different from soy milk, which tastes different from coconut milk, which is different from rice milk. And each one has their own sorts of specialties that can do things not exactly like dairy, but maybe better in their own niche. So together, like these milks can do more than, than the original. And there's some attempts in the, in the meat analog space to do this. I think Fable Foods is doing something really cool with using shiitake mushroom stems to make a beef-like uh, beef -like product, but they're really ingredient forward and are like, we're not beef. We're a mushroom dish that hits some of those itches, but it's really like special for its own thing and it can do more than meat in its own way. Um, so personally, I, I, I think that it would be great if we could substitute you know, all the half the lobster at, at Red Lobster for a meat analog. I think tofu is going to be just a, a huge failure at most attempts of that, just because again, the standards. Um, and I, I think it's also been the case up till now, for the most part, that the alt protein space has been very much science focused. Let's build a great product that's exactly like me. And the mindset hasn't really taken into account chefs and how they think about food. And chefs don't necessarily want a direct substitute in a lot of contexts. Um, so there's a lot of chefs who do, you know, there's a lot of chefs who do want that easy option, but um, they want it as a way to fill demand, not as like, oh, I just care about animals and climate. They're like, no, if we have a demand for these foods and it's easier for me to use, like, sure, let's do it. Um, you know, so I think, yeah, I feel like I'm I'm trailing off, but that's kind of. And then you had you you said some something something earlier, I guess your your broader question was, um, if you get if you get tofu into restaurants that are smaller, mom and pop that won't have much effect probably in the short term. And I, I agree with that. Um, to be honest, I mean, I think alt proteins are going to have impact in like the medium to long term. And in the short term, they've been like relatively low impact given all the investment poured in. And I think tofu is going to be the same way. Um, most likely the food will, if it grows, it's going to take a, a decade or two um, it's going to find its own niches. I think the first step though, is to establish tofu as a desirable culinary ingredient, because as soon as you establish it to be a um, Yeah. Is it, I think, I don't know, did I accidentally mute you or? No, I, I had a call come through and it said that the Zoom oh, okay. was muted. Um, okay. Okay. But, as soon as you establish these tofus as something that's culinarily desirable, you have word of mouth, you have chefs talk to each other, foodies talk to each other about these ingredients and you can grow just so much more fast than like directing just pure marketing dollars at it. Um, and so, yeah, I, did I answer your question? I feel like, no, you did. I, 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 yeah, I think um, one of the things that I completely agree with and uh, a good example that you raised was um, plant-based milk in that uh, we have that portfolio of, you know, different types of plant-based milk and people liking it for what it is as opposed to just attaching value to it only because they think that it's a replacement to dairy. And I think that that is um, a very interesting approach that Alternative proteins doesn't really take because their main goal is to just substitute meat directly. And I, I think that we can get demand for tofu and maybe, um, I don't know, one day if we have like McDonald's uh, selling, you know, tofu food that's delicious, uh, that would also popularize it and uh, allow for it to have more people actually 
uh, buying it. Uh, we talked a lot about the US so far, and I wanted to ask if you ever considered bringing tofu to Europe. Um, I feel like that's somewhere where I think tofu um, is likely to kick off uh, and uh, may also have a lot of impact. Absolutely. And, you know, I'll caveat this. I'm still really early in my career and trying to spread tofu in the US. And our book has taken a long time and we're nearing the finish line, um, but we'll have a lot more data points on how it's received once the book's out. Um, and I'm also just starting to apply for farmer's markets to actually curate some of these tofus and, and sell, you know, in person like that. So if, th if that goes well, that will tell us more about, you know, future prospects. I think Europe seems awesome. If I had a big business going on now, like I would absolutely consider looking at Europe. Um, I think there's maybe different, different landscape. It seems like your average consumer, at least in like England, it's like really down with the sustainability aspect of, of, of plant-based foods and like maybe um, less personally invested in animal agriculture. Um, I assume that's similar elsewhere in Europe. Some challenges are that Europe just doesn't have a lot of sustainable soybeans. And so most soy product, from my understanding, is, is imported from Brazil, where a lot of soy growth is like leading to Amazon deforestation. You know, I, I think the majority of soy growth in the in the Amazon and in the Cerrado is used for like beef, like raising cattle. Um, so, I, you know, I don't really know how much eating a block of tofu in Europe affects this issue. Um, but it's a little bit dicier than in the US where we just have a ton of land, a ton of cheap soy. Um, yeah, so I, I would like to look into that more, but absolutely, I mean, it seems like a, a great overall opportunity. Yeah, and I know you mentioned this uh, where when you were like, um, you think that this could you know, take a decade, but what is your timeline for where Chinese tofu look like in the US and what are the big challenges that you think are in the way of increasing the market for tofu? Timeline, I wish I had a timeline. Um, I mean, I would like to have a business that can self-sustain itself in the next year because right now I'm, I'm using some grant funding to pay my bills and, you know, a little bit of savings to cushion it. In terms of like overall time Tofu could take to spread in the U.S., I mean, there are products that you recognize at at any grocery store that are still like actively growing. And so I think the growth can take, you know, 10, 20 years till something's totally saturated. And even then, you know, there are a few types of tofu we wrote about in the book, but there's also like a couple dozen others in China and probably more even outside of China in other Asian countries. So I, I don't know if each of these tofus is going to require its own sort of like from the ground up approach or if interest is going to generalize and other people start doing their own research into these ingredients. Um, yeah, there's, there's just too many variables, I think, to know. Um, what was the second part of your question besides timelines? Yeah, so it was what um, do you think are the big challenges in the way? Big challenges. So there's this chicken and egg between supply and demand, where because there's no demand, there's no supply, and because there's no supply, there's no demand. Um, on the demand side, I think consumer education is really, really important. Like people just don't know how to cook these tofus. And um, that's you know, bad from the perspective of like, people won't buy your ingredients if they don't know how to cook them often. But also if they try cooking your ingredients and it doesn't work out well, they're gonna maybe hold that against you or in their mind, think of your product as something that's like just hard to cook. Um, so 
we need to develop like more uses for these in Western cooking styles. We need to develop easier recipes for home cooks. Um, I think on the more restaurant food service side, um, you know, there's the simp there's the, the the things like just confirming that there's demand there so that we can find a, a good distributor that services a lot of restaurants. Um, after that, I mean, chefs tend to be very sort of, they're, they tend to like be more like artists than scientists. They're like, I have my own way of cooking. I have my own flavor preferences. Um, I kind of want to want to find my own way to do this. And so in that sense, it seems maybe harder to scale food service applications like than I maybe initially assumed. At least on the the more restaurant-y side, less of like the institutional food service cafeterias. Um, and so, you know, if you don't have a lot of dialogue between chefs, then you just have a slower like rate of innovation and growth. I think there's pushback a little bit from chefs in serving soy foods. And my impression is that that's largely misinformed and that they it's that chefs think that consumers don't want soy or that the consumers who would want plant-based options also don't want soy. So it's kind of, you know, serving, if you're a cafeteria, you have all these, all these niche audiences to serve. And like, you know, one of them is this group that just doesn't like any of these allergens. And so they're like, oh, we'll cut all the allergens out. Um, I think restaurants are less inhibited by that. Um, you know, I think consumers, just like from conversation, the vast majority don't care about soy. They don't think it's a bad thing. It's really a small minority that makes a lot of noise. Um, but, you know, if that minority makes more noise, that could be a challenge to overcome. Um, fortunately, the science is all supportive of soy as a healthy food and as a sustainable food in the US. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one potential challenge on the supply side is ingredient quality and consistency. It seems to make way more sense to import than to produce locally because the cost to set up a factory is just is so high or to retrofit like an existing tofu factory for these tofus is costly without even proving that there's demand for these ingredients. But when we're importing, um, you know, it, it's it, it's really necessary to ensure that we're getting super high quality product so that people start associating these good associations. Um, you know, if there's, you know, food safety problems, an outbreak or anything, you know, that would be really bad. I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I think like in general, though, a lot of the challenges are going to be more apparent as we get going. And right now we're so early, it's hard to know what the biggest sticking points are gonna be. Yeah, and do you know of any other players in the space who you could work with? I hear the Good Food Institute does a lot of work with regards to alternative proteins, but do you see anything similar um, to that for tofu? Man, yeah, I, I actually volunteered with the Good Food Institute Asia Pacific uh, a few years back and really love the organization. Um, unfortunately, they're just really not interested in non-meat analogs. And I get that their, their theory of change is, you know, the price taste convenience uh, trifecta, you know? And uh, I'm very much focused on not taste, price, and convenience. I'm focused on like, let's just create value elsewhere for consumers. Um, so they've, they've not really been too much help in that sense. Um, who has been helpful. I think there's a lot of different interest groups that sort of overlap. There is this sort of plant forward chef world that is based around the Culinary Institute of America. And 
you know, they, they put on conferences. I attended one of them and I'm going to speak at the school over the summer. Um, so I think building some, some relationships and coalitions there could be really helpful. The big tofu producers in the U S have honestly been really unexcited about doing more with these other legacy tofus. It's again, one of these questions of like, for the tofu companies that are familiar with these tofus, they don't think there's any demand and they don't have money to invest in marketing. On the, you know, then there's also tofu companies, Pulma One is a big Korean conglomerate and these tofus aren't popular in Korea. They don't exist in Korea. So like I talked with those guys and they're like, oh yeah, no, this seems, we don't do that, you know? Um, so maybe once we have some basic proof of demand, uh, proof, you know, then we'll be able to, turn to Pomoan or Hodo and and be like, hey, let's let's partner, let's let's get some some local production set up. Or even invest in in more like collaborative marketing. Um who else has been helpful? There's just like To be honest, I think I'm still pretty early in this process. And so once the book's out again, find more allies. Lately, it's been much of like, much more of like, oh yeah, a lot of people in the vegan world really support this sort of additive protein approach. So they're like really encouraging and connecting me with resources, whether that's like funders or, you know, marketing people. Um, but I think still a lot of it's just, myself needing to get out an MVP or get out something that can, can be that launch pad. Yeah. And um, I think we've talked a lot about uh, the tofu landscape and I wanted to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, you and uh, what you've been up to. So you recently launched a book. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. Um, so I actually haven't launched Broken Cuisine yet. Um, we're still in the midst of switching printers because our previous one just turned out to be like very low quality, very underwhelming, too expensive. So I'm talking with factories in China to figure out, you know, better paper options, better color options. And if our current chats go well, we'll have the book shipped over within two to three months. Um, but yeah, so my, my book is called Broken Cuisine. And the premise is that more and more consumers want to eat less meat, but many are finding it hard to do so. And the reason they're finding it hard to do so is that our plant-based options overwhelmingly are either subtractive, meat dishes without the meat, or substitutive, meat dishes with largely still inferior in flavor and in cost and in branding. Uh, plant-based analogs. Um, and, you know, so my, my, my point is that until we fix this problem, it's not going to matter how much moral messaging there is, like consumers just aren't going to switch over. It's, um, on the flip side, you know, yeah. So, so yeah, that, that's the main premise of the book. And um, to fix that problem, one approach could be to create new foods sort of not connected to previous meat standards. Um, and the proteins that we're working with to do that are, are these Chinese tofus that are um, uncommon varieties in the US and that are sometimes pretty rare in China as well, that each have their own unique strengths that can be cooked in ways that can do more than meat or more than whatever exists. Um, yeah, so working on the book, um, in the meantime, I started a tofu newsletter, which, you know, I'm hoping can be built into a platform for me to continue my tofu research, do something ongoing, create some sort of like best place on the internet to get your tofu information. Um, and I'm working on building up a tofu import business called Soycery, where uh Right now I'm working with some, a designer in Brazil to build out packaging and talking with some factories in China, got some samples from them. And as soon as we have packaging, 
we'll be able to probably structure an order to ship over. Um, maybe not right away. I I, I want to watch. I kind of want to watch watch the book first before we kind of need to. It's it's this chicken and egg again because you know, once the book's out, there's not great ingredient supply, so people are going to be like, "Oh, how do I cook these foods?" But then, um, it's expensive to ship over a pallet of this stuff. So got to figure that out. But those are the three main things: uh, broken cuisine, tofu Tuesday newsletter, and soycery. Yeah, and um, what got you started um, in working uh, in tofu? And uh, tell us a little bit about um, your journey uh, to like caring a lot about animal welfare. I went vegetarian in high school and instantly regretted it. It felt like you know all our options in St. Paul, Minnesota were either subtractive or substitutive. It felt like I gave up my relationships that were built around food. Um, I was just unhappy. And all of that changed that summer when I was really fortunate to be able to spend a month in China doing a language exchange. Um, in the city I was in, uh, Tianjin, which is in kind of near Beijing, 50% um, of the breakfast foods were vegan. Probably 70 to 80% were vegetarian. And People ate these foods not because they were meat free, but because these were just great foods that were traditional and always existed in this area. Um, things like silk and tofu pudding topped with fragrant star anise and daylily flower gravy. A little bit of fermented tofu and chili oil on top. Things like laminated baked bread that have all this toasted tahini and five spice powder between the layers. So it's it's savory and rich. Things like crepes, but instead of made out of wheat, they're made out of pure ground mung bean. So have a softer texture, they're, they're chewier and high in protein and topped with fried bread and sauces. And I could go on and on. The foods of this town, were, or the city were just I thought were incredible and suddenly eating was a joy again. And so I decided then and there to um, spend my career trying to promote more of these foods back in the States so that people like me would find it easier to eat plants. I spent a couple summers trying to learn to cook, working in Buddhist restaurants and taking classes under some monastery chefs. Um, found that maybe the kitchen wasn't my forte and translating cuisine is like so hard because it's so, you know, so much there. Um, so then thought, you know, what can I master or get really good at that's smaller? And so, you know, thought, what about tofu, which is the cornerstone of vegan Chinese food? Um, so then uh, while I was studying abroad in college, was in class a couple days a week, and then otherwise just traveling around taking the train from city to city, trying to find really delicious vegan foods. And at the end of that, that semester, I, I spent um, some time apprenticing in an ancient tofu factory in inland China, learning to make like multiple tofu varieties. So just like, you know, one thing led to another. And since coming back to the States have sort of updated again in favor of focusing on tofu rather than cuisine. Um, I think that people have wildly different taste preferences and it's so hard to like transport a cuisine that people don't even know what's authentic because it's not a market for it. Um, and everyone has different uh, perspectives on it versus an ingredient like tofu is instantly adaptable to anyone's diet. Um, so I've, I've sort of leaned more into going hard on the tofu. Um, and specifically marketing it as like an ingredient. Yeah, and um, do you have any advice for somebody who wants to do something similar with like, um, you know, a vegan ingredient uh, that they want to promote? Um, are there any learnings that you've had along this journey that you'd like to share? One that I don't know how, how how effective this is as a use of EA money, but generally just like traveling more to regions that other people from your 
communities like don't travel to as much of. I think like that sort of cross-cultural dialogue seems really valuable. For most of history, most people, it mostly plants in most of the world. Not everywhere, but I think that's broadly true. And yet there's very little discussion on these traditional vegetarian and vegan foods. Um, so I think, I think looking into that could be helpful. Um, if you're interested in doing more with tofu specifically, um, I'm, all, I'm ha always happy to chat with people um, and, and find more collaborators. I think like, you know, we could use more, more, we could use more resources in the recipe development world, like getting chefs excited about cooking with these foods. We could use more, more help, like, um, with marketing, like, you know, building like great social media content around tofu, um, like could use more help on supply. Like, you know, every, every part of this sort of chain of like, how do we get tofu to people and how do we educate them? Like we could do more with, um, yeah. Um, I think like besides tofu, what else? One thing that seems promising now is there's like five types of Chinese seitan and seitan's like slowly becoming more popular in the US, but our options are like very, very, very low quality compared to what's in China. And even like Chinese supermarket varieties are like not great. Um, one of my friends who who runs like a, a social media, YouTube, Instagram channel, um, called Bold Flavor Vegan. He does homemade mock meats and he's found that one type of Chinese leaven seitan called kaofu uh, is doing like really well. People are really excited about it. Um, and so if someone was interested in exploring that whole world, you know, maybe not tofu, but something similar, um, I think uh, there's a lot that could be done. And maybe even more on the meat substitute side. Um, if you're really like, into that rather than like the ingredient focused approach. Yeah. I think like doing something cool and unique seems to get people's attention. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there because I've now I'm just, now I'm just spitballing. Yeah. Um, before we go, do you have um, any thoughts on something that we haven't covered yet? Anything you wish you were asked? Uh, nothing off the top of my head. I think if you want to learn more about these tofus, um, sign up for my newsletter, Tofu Tuesday. Uh, it, you can find it on Substack. Um, if you want to find great Chinese tofus near you at your grocery stores or Chinese restaurants, like would love to help you find, find them. So hit me up. Um, yeah, I think that's that's all from my end. Yeah, thank you so much, George. I think that um, some of the things that I've definitely learned is that um, this new approach of like the additive approach of, of tofu is really, really promising um, in comparison to the, uh, you know, uh, the other approaches that, you know, we you would normally take in at least the effective altruism community with regards to alternative proteins. And I've learned a lot about the tofu landscape and all the talk about tofu has made me really hungry. And um, I can't wait to see tofu becoming more popular and widespread. Uh, thank you for all that you do for animals, George, and uh, for your time. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks for having me, Kartik.